Vanilla OS is very much a new kind of operating system or rather distro, Linux distro. And funnily enough, Mirko, who is the author, I knew way before this project. And in fact, I ever even interviewed him as the author, one of the authors of the Battles app for, you know, using Windows apps in Linux in an easy way. You might have, might have seen that video. If not, go check it out. So when he published this new project, obviously we talked about it and I was kind of interested into using it. And it sent me like an image one month before, one month ago, and luckily I hadn't the time to test it, but finally I have some time to, you know, actually talk about what vanilla OS is and how it works. Now, a lot of props to Mirko to actually, for actually explaining to me how all of this worked because I'm extremely ignorant, but now I can actually explain to you what he told me. Also, it was very funny to see how he explained that he has worked on this project for quite a while now, has kind of a toy project, and then he announced uh, the open beta on his Twitter without expecting that much success. And instead, now there are multiple articles and people reaching out and hundreds of people on the Discord. And now he has to, you know, scale up and allow other people to help him and have a structure and everything. So that was actually quite a big change, but it also shows that fact that there is a clear interest in a project like this. So how it works. Oh, before that, yes, uh, this won't be a video with a lot of screenshots and, you know, applications and GUI user interfaces, because, you know, a lot of the things here are very technical and uh, there's nothing to show, but a lot of technical information to uh, explain. So Yes, I could show the fact that they have a beautiful wallpaper and it's indeed beautiful and there's even a dark variant, but that's really not the point. Let's try to focus on the technical side of things. So let's start with saying that Vanilla OS is an immutable operating system, similarly to Fedora Kinoite for KDE on, or Silver Blue for GNOME. Other examples could be like Macintosh, Chrome OS, but those not Linux, kind of Linux for Chrome OS, but never mind. What this means is that the operating system cannot be touched by the user except for the user space. That is your home folder with your files in it, obviously, but also things like ATC, which contains some config files and also cache for, you know, cache. Everything else in theory should not be touched as uh, touched in a immutable system. As an example, you have the USR folder, which contains some libraries and application that in theory should not be editable by the user. Now, the only way to actually edit the operating system uh, in these folders that are protected from the user is through safe ways. As an example, let's say that you're installing a kernel module that should be something rather safe because maybe you're using a dedicated drive manager or packer manager that supports immutable functions, these kind of things, then you're only allowed to edit the root system via these safe ways. This is the general theory. How it's actually implemented varies depending on the operating system that you're looking at. Now, let's make a, a couple of examples so we can actually understand better this concept before stepping to Vanilla OS. Let's start with uh, Fedora Silverbrew and Kinoite. So Fedora Silverbrew and Kinoite uses OS3, which is kind of a versioning system, a bit like Git, if you know that. Uh, but of course, the developers uh, realize that, you know, people still need to install their applications. So how do that work? So they build RPM OS3, which is kind of similar to DNF, except that when you install a new application, it creates its own branch. I said it's like Git, it creates its own branch and the application is installed in that branch. Now, when you boot again the system, that branch uh, acts a bit like a, as a layer and is mounted on top of the root so that the print the operating system thinks that those things are installed within the OS, whereas it's actually the, the files are actually somewhere else entirely. If anything goes wrong in this process, then again, by when you boot, you can select to uh, revert uh, to the previous branch in group. 
Micro OS, second example, has something similar. It uses BTRFS as its file system. And this file system has a snapshot functionality, which means that whenever you install an application or you know whenever you want, you create a snapshot, which of course is optimized to consume not that much uh, disk space and such. And then if anything goes wrong, then you can uh, revert to the previous snapshot, which obviously, as we were talking in the context of root, is only of root and not of your personal files in this case. So these are two kinds of implementation, Fedora with OS3 and uh, MicroOS with BTRFS. Uh, and in both cases, if anything goes wrong, you can always reboot and switch back to the, back to the previous snapshot or revert a branch. So which one does Vanilla OS use? Uh, neither. Vanilla has its actually own approach, but before getting into details of how Vanilla OS handles the mutability, let me actually thank the sponsor of this video, which is Internext. Thanks to Internext for actually sponsoring the video. They offer secure slot storage, which is not only secure, but also open source. It is secure because it uses end-to-end -end encryptions and modern zero knowledge protocols to make sure that all of your files and folders are actually 100% private and secure. And you can always check that because they actually have all of their code on their GitHub. So you can actually go there and read all of it. So why actually using cloud storage at all? Well, it is great for keeping all of your personal files and photos in one place, and it's a much safer option compared to storing it in your personal computer, which can break down or can be easily hacked. And Obviously, with cloud storage, you can actually access all of your files from your phone, computer, and all of the other devices that you have. So if you're looking for something that is ethical, open source, private, and secure, they actually have three products, which are Drive, Photos, and Send. And while Drive and Photos actually allow you to synchronize your files and photos well, throughout your devices, Send actually allows you to send files that are up to five gig gigabytes big. And of course, Send is also just as secure and private. They do have a web interface, but because they are committed to actually supporting free and open source software, they also have a desktop application that uh, does not only work on Windows and Macintosh, but also on Linux. And you can just install it right away as a Debian package in this case. It is also present in the Arch Linux Hour, if you're more into that. And finally, as a app image file. So if you're interested, they actually offer up to 10 gigabytes out of the box. And if that's not enough, they have many plans, which you can actually get discounted using code NICCO25. So N-I-C-C-O 25, my name and 25. And that actually gives you a 25% discount on all annual plans. So what can I say? Try it out. Couple of things to wrap it up. If you do want to use a free account or a discount, there's a link in the video description and you should use that one. Again, link in the video description. And there's actually a new release just between me filming that part of the video and me filming this video now. They have released the feature of being able to share files password protected. protected I can say it. So you can just give a link around with a password so it's safer. So yeah, check them out. Anyway, Vanilla OS, I was talking about Vanilla OS. Vanilla OS relies on the immutable attributes of files. If you add uh, the I attribute to a file, which stands again for immutable, then it cannot be longer edited by anyone, regardless of whether you actually have writing uh, permissions. So you add I as a property, you cannot change it. When you take I off, as a property, then of course you can get back to changing that file. And Vanilla OS just relies on that. Whenever you want to turn on or off immutability, Vanilla OS under the hood just changes the I attribute of the root file so that you can no longer edit them even if you're root. And this guarantees immutability and also allows for something that neither Fedora, Kinoita, Silverblue, MicroOS could allow, give you, which is on-demand immutability. Sometimes you do need to edit something within the system, you just turn off immutability, and then when you're sure that everything went well, you can turn it on again. 
as an example, say that you need to install a driver for the Linux kernel. Uh, as an example, the NVIDIA package on Ubuntu, this vanilla OS is based on Ubuntu, that package is really meant to work and there's not much that could go wrong. So you turn off immutability, you install that package, you turn it on again, and that's it. It's really meant mostly to install kernel modules. There's also another way that it could make sense to use this feature, which is very interesting. And uh, this, I'll actually share an uh, anecdote about this. So just a few days ago, my girlfriend, who uses KD Neon, as I suggested her too, um, updated to the last version of KD Neon. And that update broke everything. Now, she's not a nerd. She has Linux because I installed Linux on her machine. She asked, kind of. <laughs> so her in Italy, not having a functioning computer anymore because KD Neon broke on the update whilst I was here in Sweden, not being able to help her in any way except by a phone calls meant that we <laughs> were there at 1 a.m. just trying to debug what happened to KD Neon during the update. It was not funny. So how do immutable systems help here? On-demand immutable system especially, what I can do is take Vanilla OS, install it, turn off immutability, set it up exactly how I know it's going to be used whilst I'm there, and then I turn on immutability, I can go off to Sweden without ever, ever, ever worrying anything going wrong. She can't mess this up, even if she wanted to. So it is in some way, a functionality that allows you to set up a system for somebody else and make sure that you developer uh, can turn off immutability and do whatever you know it's going to work to set up that system and then turn on immutability for your actual users and users, my girlfriend in this case. Now, immutable systems usually are tied up with two different concepts, which are offline updates and atomic updates. So what are offline updates firstly? So whenever you install an update, all the packages are downloaded and a transaction with the software manager is uh, created. However, it is not applied until you actually reboot the system so that the actual update does not, uh, is not applied uh, when you're using the system at the same time. This is what Windows does, this is what Macintosh does, this is what everybody does at this point because it's common sense that you should not change the version that you're using whilst you're using it. And this actually has caused some headaches even in the KDE world. Sometimes you update and then you find out that half of Dolphin is not even working anymore because while well, during the update, you're using an older version of Dolphin which was already loaded into RAM, but then another component just got loaded and that was an updated version and the two don't talk to each other anymore. And that makes sense, there are two different versions. Making sure that you reboot and you only apply the updates when you reboot, make sure that nothing like that could ever happen. It's a, safe, it's a way to make sure that you don't mess it up. So what are atomic updates then? And uh, okay, so you install the updates, but the, play, the update is only applied if it works. That is, the transaction with the package manager is created. It is applied at the right moment when you reboot. If everything goes well, the system does a check. If everything goes well, then you boot into your system. If anything goes wrong, if anything, even just a single package, the whole update is discarded. You switch back to whatever the files were like before doing the update, and you prompt the user to retry to update at a later date. This makes sure that you never do an update and then end up with a broken system when you should be using your system, just like, you know, my girlfriend four days ago at 1 a.m. just saying. So these three things together, immutability, offline updates, atomic updates, make sure that your sister, your system is just safer from anything that could go wrong. And then there's even more stuff on top of it. So they have APX, which is APT with uh, an X at the end. 
And here there's actually a collaboration to make this from the, with the Distrobox uh, maintainer creator, which is Luca Di Maio. And basically what this does is whenever you install an application with APX, this is not applied to your root system because who knows what might happen, right? Maybe you're thinking that you're downloading Steam and then your whole system gets removed because of some dependency issues. Pop OS, right? Right. <laughs> you know, just to avoid any Linux tech tips issue, what happens is that there's a container that you initialize when you start using APX. And then whenever you install something, that something is actually installed via APT, but inside of the container. And then via magic, and Mirko actually explained this to me as magic, so it is magic, the files that the application that is installed in the container is exposed to the operating system so that it is the operating system thinks that it, it is actually installed here like it adds a service so you can uh, see it in your application menu just as if it was installed in your os but it's in inside a container and all the user files such as if it's Steam, it's the user library, as an example, still live in your home directory, which means that if the containers for any reason dies, or maybe you, you restart it, you reset it, you still have all the files in your home directory, in your user space, and if you install Steam again, you don't lose any of them. And if anything goes terribly, terribly wrong, like installing Steam removes your operating system, then that only happened in the container and you can kill off the container, start it again as if it was new. Nothing went wrong. Now, at this point, my notes uh, literally says it is safe in block Mayusk, it refer referring to vanilla OS. So I guess that's really the point. What else? Well, vanilla OS does have a graphical tool to install the drivers, which is pretty nice. It's meant for gaming according to the website, but I mean, the idea is that that tool should set up your drivers without you having to think about that. And it also has always the latest kernel, a Linux kernel. So that's also very nice if you need this kind of things. There's also an installation process, which is actually being ported to a nice GTK4 toolkit that, um, actually asks you how you want your system to be. As an example, you can select whether you want to use flat packs, snaps, or, uh, up images, and depending on your choices, Vanilla OS just sets everything up as you ask for it. So these are the nice things, but the, the main point was, was not this. The main point was the whole thing before, immutability, updates, APX, that. Then there's also the, the nice things. Just to wrap it up, of course, the first question I asked to Mirko was, uh, this is coming for KDE Plasma 2, right? Because currently Vanilla OS has GNOME Vanilla out of the box. So GNOME without anything changed, which means no extra theming as Ubuntu usually does, but so just GNOME. So I, I mean, of course they are going to do a version for KDE Plasma 2, right? And luckily he answered with something like, oh, sure, you, you're going to help, right? And I kind of disappeared. No, I'm just kidding. So th they do want to do something like that. Eventually, it all depends, of course, on the workforce that they have. And as far as actually maintaining it, it should be feasible. But as far as making the tools and porting them to Qt and QML, that's a whole another story. It's actually something that if I have some free time, I'll try to help with, but no guarantees. But it's, it, it is something they would want, ideally. No guarantees, but you know, one day you can. Thanks everybody for following along and see you tomorrow with another video.